I'm Jessica Peresta, host of the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. the high check podcast with will and josh uh we are here as we say every week because we can't come up with a better intro so if you have one send it to us um as though we yeah, should think so, through, maybe. yeah i don't know you know maybe next time i'll say like we are there you know like really throw people off be like where is there you know that would make the difference yep because mm-hmm. everybody thinks like a dr seuss book um <laughs> I claim uh, thing two. Yeah, well, you know, oh, thing two. Wow. Okay. Well, that makes you thing um, one. That's all. I guess. What if I want to be the cat? No. You know, well, I don't want to be a cat. That's wrong. That's that's. <laughs> I don't like that's the, that's the only. I only know the Grinch and the Cat in the Hat. That's like basically the only two. There's something about a Horton, right? I know uh, it's also a college, but isn't a it? Horton that like hears a, a who. Okay, that makes total sense. And Hortons um, are different than Wharton. But it's fine. Okay. Yeah, clearly. Next episode, we'll be talking about the difference of Dr. Seuss books. Now, welcome to the High Tech Podcast. Uh, we are excited for another week. More topics, more fun, more excitement. Uh, but this week, we got a guest. <laughs> I said but like as if it was contrast. More fun and excitement, but this week, not so but much. This guy we're bringing on. <laughs> yeah, this guy. No, um, super excited. We have Justin Phillips joining us. Um, we're doing a thing again where we're recording the intro before we've actually done the interview. You guys are like, is weird. isn't that what you normally do? But it's no. not. Um, it's 100% not what we do. So uh, with that said, we don't really actually know what this interview is going to be like. We don't. I think it's going to be awesome and exciting. I'm super excited to do it. Uh, but we are talking to Justin Phillips. He's an assistant dean of academic affairs. That's yeah, we've, we've really upgraded. We've gone from yeah, just like upgraded. peons to like head, head wow. guy. And that was how Will instantly offended every other guest we've ever had on the High Tech Podcast. Yeah, you're all peons. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love you. Um, all of you. And my yeah, brother. Oh, yeah. My uh, sister-in-law. Uh, Coggle. Robin, everybody. Justin, you're all great. Co- Robin, all the Justin, apps yeah, we've interviewed. But Justin Phillips is apparently the peak of where we've reached. Um, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, he's exciting. Will knows him better than I do. And by better, I mean Will knows him. I don't. And uh, Justin is joining us. Um, specifically to talk about, uh, he's had some experience teaching art online, and this is kind of a uh, another part of a little mini series thing we did, which is not really a mini series. We didn't intend it to be until it kind of just happened. It, it just um, fell on our laps this way. I mean, it just fell on our lap. We've talked on the podcast a lot about what it looks like to teach things online that aren't necessarily easy to teach online, or a lot of people might say it's impossible to teach online. You know, like scuba diving, acupuncture tanks tanks um i still argue that's totally possible we proved it uh <laughs> with our micro app uh episode um <laughs> but uh things that are tougher to teach online you know um what does make movement you know i don't know i'm coming up with course tai chi. tai chi tai chi was one yep um space travel uh is oh, might be another one you know sure. <laughs> yeah um vigilanteism is that a course no, no, that no, would be really sh- cool. It probably does exist under that title, but it's hopefully a study of vigilanteism. No, I'd like to imagine Bruce Wayne is like, this is how to be Batman. <laughs> like that, you know what I mean? Like, hey, you in the back, one, listen up, Batarang. Step one, have enough money. Step two, yeah. come up with an animal-based superhero suit. Step three, be awesome. Like, that's the three steps to being Batman. You know? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Anyway. So Justin is not coming on to talk about what it looks like to be Batman, unless he is Batman and we don't know. Uh, you know, it, it could be. Um, yeah. We'll ask. Uh, but he's going to talk about what it looks like to teach art online. He had to transition um, and had to kind of figure out a strategy uh, to doing that. And so I'm excited to hear kind of what worked, what didn't, um, his thoughts on uh, whether doing online 
art courses is actually like a realistic thing. Um, I'm excited to hear his opinions on it. So, um, yeah, that's it. That's all I got for you. You want to hear the rest of us. Let's jump in with Justin Phillips. Okay, so we are about to dig in with the most amazing, the most awesome, the most wonderful, amazing assistant dean of academic affairs. I want to use A's. Oh, so many A's in there. Amazing yeah, assistant. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff. I feel like we needed a drum roll on that. Academic <laughs> affairs. <Did Yeah>. <laughs> Justin <laughs> Phillips, thank you for joining us uh, for this recording. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited awesome. to be able to talk to you guys. So thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. Um we queued up the episode. Josh is like, I don't know what to do. I don't know. Yeah, I was uh, introing and I was like, I don't know, Justin. Uh, I think I said, Will knows Justin better than I do, which basically was just me saying, Will knows I, Justin. Knows like, you that, at all. That, that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, we actually met, we all live in our same little local area. Uh, Josh and I have worked for a couple of institutions locally. You're at an art institution. Yes, sir. Um, we met in a coffee shop and you were actually serving me a bagel, right? Yeah. Wasn't that the situation? Yeah. I don't even know. Yeah, how so my, friend, was. my friend had a, a deli in town and uh, it was the kind of thing, you know, between, between semesters, between break, yep. uh, you know, during break, it was the kind of thing he was, in, uh, you know, he started a business and I said, this sounds like a lot of fun and something I want to give a hand you know, to help out with. And yeah, exactly. So get to meet some great local people who met Will and his wife and, uh, started talking about education and teaching and work yeah. he does and uh, yeah, I love so I love how you said that though. You got to meet some great local people and Will, so that's to- I, I get it. It's totally fine. Those are it's separate okay. qualities. I'm right there with <laughs> you. Uh, you know? <laughs> I, love how you, I love how you open that up to say like, isn't that the faculty's thing? I knew a faculty member from one of my former institutions who literally would go and be a bellboy at the at, I have no better term for that at the luggage guy I don't know he he and he would say that I was a bellboy at the Hershey uh Hershey hotel this mm-hmm. is like a 55 60 year old man like in the summers he went and he just hung out at the Hershey hotel and, and moved things around yeah. but uh, I I was getting a cream <laughs> cheese and lox bagel and yeah. you were just like oh I do this thing what do you do and we we that we connected that was a few years ago and you yeah. sometimes got to take those chances to uh to meet folks so now we've we've had Absolutely. a pretty fun connection since then yes. you at that time, probably maybe just instructing, but very shortly thereafter, we went to the pandemic and you were becoming a, I believe, a virtual learning coordinator, director. What was that like? Yeah. Well, it was uh, that position. It was a hybrid position that was faculty and staff. Uh, so it was full time year round. And a lot of it was doing support programming during the pandemic, uh, supporting ah. students, supporting faculty uh, and, and helping Helping in a variety of ways and identifying learning interferences, helping students navigate the the online landscape. Um, So a lot of that kind of work that I was doing was informed by what was going on in the classroom. Also interacting with faculty, interacting with students. I was really involved with our kind of core retention group that we kind of help students uh, through support and and we all know how the pandemic just threw a wrench in everybody's <laughs> lives. So there's so many different learning interferences and things for us to kind of tackle. But a lot of the work that I did was on the, I'm an academic affairs and worked through a ten, uh, center for teaching and learning. So it was a lot of, okay. um, awesome. a lot of uh, working with students. We created mentor programs and tutoring programs with student mentors, okay. with faculty and alumni. We had uh, study wow. tables, which we still have today which students can come in and get some extra support in their coursework, whether it's studio or academics like writing. Um, But a lot of that, you know, like you said, was online. So it was kind of how do you navigate those kinds of challenges? And then some of these students never experienced online learning before. So yeah, the, the thing about the pandemic was, you know, we were three quarters of the way through an academic year. So a lot of them were already established in in their studio practices. Uh, mm. But the next year was, you know, definitely had its its own challenges and its own opportunities. So uh, right. for, for us to kind of grow. So Yeah, I, I know plenty of folks at that moment, the pivot, you know, yes. towards pandemic instruction. It's like, 
I think some folks gave up. Some folks gave it as much as they could. Some folks tried to like make the best, you know, like I think it was definitely those three tiers of attitude of like, well, this is this semester's shot. And then, all right, I'll try my best. And then some folks like, let's, let's make, let's make something cool yeah. with this. Mm-hmm. I am personally so ignorant to the fundamentals of art and art instruction. So for, for my sake and maybe some of our audience sake, you know, studio yeah. art <laughs> and Josh, yeah. uh, studio art is figures. like the students are actually creating something physical. Is that, is that a specific element of studio art? Like I would imagine yeah. that's part of what's difficult of pivoting that as compared to like graphic or, or visual media. Yeah. Media. Um, well, studio arts is in the foundation year at the college. We, they learn drawing, they learn 2d design, which is composition, which is applicable okay. to all different visual arts. Okay. 3D design, which is like form, sculpture. Yep. They also learn um, digital imaging, which is a lot of Photoshop, you know, capturing images, how to tweak them and, and alter them and uh, work. They work with uh, Adobe InDesign to create books and things like that. Wow. So yeah. for okay. the studio art, it was um, and the foundation year this is all the first year students have that same experience. They go through our foundation year and then they go into their majors the second year. Um, so it's different for each of the art. So for me, uh, teaching 2D design was an easier transition. Okay. Teaching 3D design is, is really challenging or drawing from observation when you have a model or a still life. It challenges you to really kind of rethink your practice and how you're accessing, um, you know, well, achieving the course out, the outcomes for the assignments, also for the course. Um, so, you know, like for me, it was we were a month away from finishing the semester. They were they were into their second to last assignment. I did some retooling of some things, right? Because of scale, like the one the last assignment was a thirty by forty inch self portrait painting. Whew. So they they weren't quite so it would have been really challenging for them because there's a lot of processes that we do in person that I show them also just working with something that scale. Um, and also just, you know, just acknowledging the fact that we're going through a really challenging time and, and yeah. the, all the students are going through different things with families, family members, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. sharing a household with four siblings and all trying to learn online at the same time. Bandwidth. Um, base like bandwidth issue. was an issue. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and physical space, like having room to work on things. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. you know, I saw it as an opportunity to kind of retool that last assignment, and I, I flipped it a little bit, and I used the paint as a preliminary tool for them to learn about one of the uh, outcomes for that assignment is about color harmonies and working with different kinds of color structures and color theory, complementary colors, uh, broken optical mixture which is like similar to what the impressionist painters would do hmm. if they would put like certain colors next to each other it would read uh you know a, a, in a different way for especially from a distance sure um also uh-huh. just tonal progressions or how how colors kind of shift depending on what's going on like as far as like something going advancing forward or receding in space right. so i allowed them to 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 do that portrait using Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop and doing digital painting. But we did a lot of the preliminary work with the paint because they, I wanted them to have that mixing opportunity that, that you get from mixing paints. So. If, if it had been just in the studio, no pandemic, you would have done that 30 by 40 paint. It would be a physical medium, but you're saying yes. like you transition with the, with the, with the pandemic and they did it digitally. They, they yeah. had some initial basis, which was good yeah. for the practice, but they finished yeah. it digitally. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So all the preliminary work, the color studies, the um, working with. So part of the assignment is doing creative mark making, we call it. So it's it's doing <laughs> interesting uh, lines and faces and following the contours and following the volumetric structure of a face. Right. So how do you how can you use line in a really thin manner and then in a in a wider um, application in certain areas. So I had them do patterning and, and things like that in their studies. Yeah. So they okay. turned in these in really interesting studies, but then the final piece, and I gave them the opportunity if they wanted to do the portrait and paint, they could. 
and some of them okay. did do it. But I, I wanted to just you know support them and support them in a really challenging time and be really mindful of what was going on in the world. And you yeah. know, it, it's you know, I think back to that time now, and it's like we didn't know what was next. <laughs> like looking back in retrospect, it's kind of like, well, you know, like. Yeah, but at the time it was scary. Like we had yeah. no idea what was going to happen, yeah. and and like I mean, I I'm sure you guys when you went into quarantine, waking up the next day and you're like, okay, there's no fever, and checking yep. in with family, and yep. everybody's okay. Yeah. And, I was trying know, to get we, home from Texas, and like we oh, literally right. we left oh. Texas, and I landed in Chicago, and New Jersey had uh, declared martial law, and I'm like, am I even getting home? Like that's yeah. that's that yeah. was my introduction yeah. to the pandemic we were supposed to be at that yeah. conference together that's right that's I forgot right about that. you didn't get to go i was i didn't get to go and uh ended up staying home he went to like the unconference version of the conference we were supposed people to go still to. showed up right like yeah and i stayed home yeah. and two days later our institution said we're totally ready to go fully online and our office who is in charge of online was like no no nobody nobody <laughs> consulted us um, <laughs> no one's ready <laughs> no no one's ready yeah I, re- I remember that but so you you talked about this a little bit but i'm curious so like for you jumping into that obviously like we look back on this i think sometimes we talk about it, we're like we had a clear strategy and a lot of us were just making it up as we go uh, but i'm curious <laughs> like did 100%. you like what was especially over that year like what was your strategy for taking, I, I'm trying to avoid using the word pivot because it gives me chills every time I say it for the amount of times I heard it over that year. <laughs> um, but the, like to to change what you were doing. So you talked a little bit about it here where you maybe changed the final assignment or things like that. But what was kind of your strategy? Okay, all of a sudden now I have to transition this stuff. How yeah, are, I know a lot year. of people struggled with like, what do I do next? Okay, for this next year, how do I tackle this? Did you kind of have a strategy that you applied for doing that and even some of how you helped other faculty maybe do it yeah. uh, as you were working. Through um, stuff. Well, I mean, I have to say the college did a really good job of preparing us for, for that. Sorry to say it, that pivot, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a safe we, space. You can say you that. Know, you're, you're I, fine, I, I remember, I remember talking to family and, and being like, yeah, I'm ready to teach tomorrow. Like I know how to use Google meet. Like I wasn't even really thinking about it. I was just like, all right. Like, and I remember emailing my class and being like, all right, I'll see you guys. Uh, you know, I'll let you know when class starts back up because we we had a pause. Yeah. But then yeah. the school gave us a generous amount of time to prepare for that pivot. Um, but good. the the time that we ended that semester, and then when we started back up in the fall, I mean, it was there was a lot of hunkering down and a lot of faculty mm-hmm. really thinking about what's next and how to approach this. We didn't know if we were going to be fully, you know, online or part like hybrid. Being in person, being in visual arts is such a tactile experience, yeah. Yeah. and um, so you know there was a lot of a lot of preparation. A lot of people really put a lot of heart and soul in, in, in planning that summer for the following fall. We mm-hmm. put together a teaching and learning series uh, through the college and the provost and the director of the uh, center for teaching and learning, and that's where Will came and, and gave us a great. Uh, lecture on universal design and accessibility. So yeah. we, we did a lot of studying, a lot of research, a lot of trial and error, tech things, and, and kind of getting our getting our ducks in a row for the fall. And um, is for me, it was being open and receptive to, to, to what should I change and how should I change it? So I think some, you know, and, and I'm thinking outside of even where I teach, um, teaching teacher friends and colleagues of mine, you know, the ones that were really receptive to changing, being open to, to flexing things a little bit, or even um, replacing an assignment and trying something different, using the virtual learning as a as a medium, were really really successful. And the ones that were like really trying to like squeeze in their typical lesson planning and. Uh, yeah assignments, you know, they, they were the ones that kind of, you know, had a little bit of a a more challenging time with it, I think. But I think that for the most part, a lot of the people that I know really kind of were pretty receptive to those changes and, and, and knowing that they have to be a little bit flexible. Um, I, I like a metaphor in that space. Um, for the folks that were kind of just trying to stuff what they did into the virtual versus the people who like, you know, 
pivoted more. We're flexible. I like a, a, a metaphor of like conversion versus translation, right? Like I really felt like some folks tried to convert what they did physically directly into virtual and they just yeah. suffered while some folks were like, I can translate this. Like I know what it is and I know yeah. what I need them to be. So let me, let me wiggle this, push that and it can, and we can do it this way. You yeah. know, that conversion translation uh, metaphor for me, I met so many faculty who wrestled with that. Yeah. And, and, and you, you're right. I think a lot of folks that were more comfortable with that translation space had better results, better experiences, but just were generally maybe a little more calm <laughs> in the process. Yeah. Cause we, a famous story for us and in the podcast is that somebody came to me and was like, I have to teach scuba. What am I supposed to do here? I'm like, at the end of the day, <laughs> right. You're not going to be able to convert scuba diving to a virtual class. Yeah. So what could you do to translate? How could you potentially make those outcomes uh, come through to learn that topic. Yeah. I don't know why yeah. this picture just now is popping in my head, but a picture of just people throwing water at somebody while they're at their computer. Like <laughs> <laughs> we've talked about this a billion times on the podcast. And that's now the first time I've imagined somebody with a bucket of water, just somebody in the backyard with a hose. Like, even just... yeah, like I got this and just put this on. And be... Yeah. <laughs> Here's how to scuba dive in virtual <laughs> learning. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's uh, and I remember, Will, you were telling me about, um, you know, people that have been teaching for a long time with, uh, you know, overhead projector um, slides or, uh, you know, s s like translating all that kind of information. Right. To right. Getting the materials. Yeah. 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 We often talked about it like uh, in similar of kind of like you're used to running on land your entire life and somebody's like, OK, now here's a boat. And we're going to not just put you in the boat, but you're going to be in the middle of the ocean. And I think a lot of us had to try to figure out time to learn how like, to, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Try, time to learn a different way of doing it. Not just take what you used to do on land and now start to try to figure it out doing the and same. I, way I love that. I love that opportunity. And it really, yeah. Yeah. like I remember being in kind of midway through that, that full year during, during the pandemic and start thinking about like, start seeing it as like silver linings. Like what are the takeaways at this point? Like what are the things that are, that I can apply to my teaching practice, even when we're fully back in person again, that, um, you know, and I think a lot of it's accessibility, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, strategies, also just thinking about learning interferences, really being like it, the, the, the pandemic really just had a, a spotlight on all the little things that, could have been in the shadows as far as like obstacles that students have in yeah. learning. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. you, you start thinking about things like, you know, they're just their situations in life and, and their, the Wi-Fi they have or the access they have. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Well, and I, I've, I've, I pick up on two things that I really appreciate Justin and what you're saying. Like there's that positivity the silver linings approach. I mean, that is a kind of an attitudinal thing, yeah. but I personally, before tonight, I have never heard the phrase learning interference. And when you first said, it, I was like, huh? And then I, I, I started processing as you were talking. I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. When we address accessibility or universal design, so often it's about the diversity of uh, mental ability, of physical ability, et cetera. Um, and that's a good space to be in. And we actually need, still need to focus on supporting students who are disabled or struggle with things that, but, but interference I think reaches as far as a disability down to the Wi-Fi, down to my I'm I'm hungry. Yeah. You know, like an interference, a learning interference can be a challenge. It can also be a good thing. So I just I like I really like that. And I think that it in and of itself is a positive way to look at some of those things that we have to wrestle with as usually challenges, usually mm -hmm. negative things, burdens, hard to accomplish. But like, hey, if it's just an interference, we can work with the students' Wi-Fi. We can yeah. find some way to translate the material into uh, Braille. We can, f you know, like, whatever it is, right? Whatever that interference is, I like that um, language. And it really shows that kind of positive, if you will, growth mindset approach to a challenge. Like, yeah. we can do this. This isn't too big. I love that. Yeah. Well, um, so we were lucky to have Amy Faust from FNM. She works at FNM. Okay. She's one of the speakers at one of the teaching and learning series. I think the second one we had. In yeah. 2021. And she spoke widely about learning, learning interferences. And that's okay. like, she, she 
she had a lot of really great exercises that we kind of all did together as a group that really kind of showcases things, organizational um, issues that students can, can have when they have multiple things going on. When you're juggling five classes, a job, a sick parent, a young sibling, a car that just broke down, bills that aren't paid, and you're juggling all those things, and then you're trying to decipher these instructions from five different classes and juggle the different due dates. And she had this amazing exercise. And I can find the video. It's on our LinkedIn learning for the mm-hmm. college at PCAD. And, um, mm-hmm. and she, she does this exercise where she runs you through this process and it puts you in that scenario. And you're like, she runs you through a progression of, of uh, questions and things that you record and refer back to. And you're like, it jumbles your mind in a way that you're like, oh, "Oh my goodness, like this is what it's like. And I'm a huge advocate. Like I'm I'm a believer that all educators should should take a class a year or every two years because it really puts you in their shoes and you lose track of that as an educator, what it's like to be a student. And um, so I took a I took a class over the summer um, and. It was just kind of like, I remember it was like 1145 at night and I was like <laughs> hammering something away. Be like, I, need, I need to submit this in 10 minutes. And I, I haven't felt that way in 20 years. Yes. And I was getting anxiety and I was like, now I know what it, I know I remember what it's like. <laughs> oh, that's, oh. That's, a, that's a cool idea. Like I like the, and just remembering what the student's perspective is. Cause it's so easy. I think for us to, to lose that. Um, and so often, like, you know, I, I call it the, uh, I'm saying this, like I have a word for it now. I can't remember what it is, but I'm just going to explain the concept. Um, like the amount of gotcha. times I've been in, in meetings or on a committee or whatever, uh, and that like inevitable argument starts to happen of like what the student does or is right. Like you start talking, oh, you're like, well, yeah, yeah, well, no, the student would do this or students like we, we, I think a lot of times hypothesize what students are like in classes we we often kind of forget it's always through our perception as a teacher so like i just i like that idea of kind of like oh you know maybe we should put every, get back in the seat. year or so just uh jump in i wouldn't mind taking an art class so i could actually know half of the stuff you're talking about um and then <laughs> yeah. also remember what it's like. quarter. <laughs> yeah okay let's well, be honest. it's it is actually a requirement in k-12 there's certain requirements on like their continuing education that yeah. that are in k-12 that yeah, we just don't good. see in higher ed or don't see consistently in higher ed i know uh, justin harbin dr harbin who's been on our podcast before uh, josh and my good friend um he has advocated at times at the faculty level yeah. that this be a, a thing that gets instituted that that faculty regularly do something if it, even if it's not just classes that he's running, but they could go take a class somewhere or something that would count as their continuing education units yeah. to stay, mm-hmm. stay on top of these things. Yeah. yeah I think it's, I think it's great. Uh, so a hard pivot here, Josh. Huh? See, I shouldn't have said anything. Now this is becoming a thing, <laughs> you know, like it's, <laughs> at, at at the end of the day, I really like we've already said, you know, you you had a pretty good attitude about things. You took it in stride. You gave some flex. Yep. Did you find something that you just you wanted to, but you just couldn't find the right way to teach it online when it came to studio arts? Um, no, I don't think so. Like, uh, not okay. that like, oh, I'm I'm great, but uh, yeah, no, no. I, uh, <laughs> We I, think uh, you are. It's totally fine. Yeah, yeah, it's totally fine. <laughs> I, you know, I taught the I taught, taught two D design one and two for so, such a long time that I knew the curriculum really well, and I, I designed a lot of it and okay. refined it over the years. And I think just being open to those challenges um, and how to kind of adjust an assignment in a certain way to once again hit those marks yeah. for the outcomes, but um, you know, just being like just being creative about it and flipping it sometimes and doing something a little bit different, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a version. It might not necessarily be what we did two years ago in studio in person, but it's, it's something similar. Um, I have colleagues that I think did a really excellent job of rethinking just their methodology and what's really important for makers and, Mm. and designers and creators 
in the 21st century. So it might not necessarily yeah. be tools that you're you're doing something in a physical space, but you're you're finding ways to source materials. Um, you're you're working with local vendors. You're finding a maker space that could take a file and do something with it. Ooh, yeah. Um, mm, okay. And you're you're adjusting it in a certain way. You're adjusting scale. You're adjusting the the methodology or the process. But you're mm. it opens them up to like other areas in which they need to as professionals need to know how to navigate the the landscape of being a professional artist. Um, okay. And you know one thing I think is really important. Um, you know, like I know a lot of people that were teaching drawing and painting, which once again is very tactile. You know, you, you want to see a professor up close with the technique is really being meta about explaining what you're doing. Ooh, mm, and, you and really and being very meta about just the whole online landscape. Like I, I remember like talking to my class and explaining why I'm having them do certain things in certain mm -hmm. ways. And how it's a little bit different now online than it was yep. a month ago in class or last year. Like yep. I would explain things. I would explain the steps we're doing, the methods we're doing um, so that they know that there is a difference between, you know, seeing something on a screen and also in person or um, mm -hmm. that this, the way that this surface looks is a little bit different to me because I'm looking at it in, in, in real life, but there's, right. there's definitely a tactile um, sheen that that isn't quite translating on screen but you, you're gonna see you can that when see it as you're like showing them on like you're taking the time to like review it with them live yeah right and i'll say when your paint dries you'll start to notice this happens but mm. don't you know it's kind of like explaining yeah. explaining it a little bit more and, and just kind of being a little bit meta about the reasoning behind things also the lesson plans like explaining okay. the steps, like, hey, we're going to do this, and then this is going to feed into this, and then from there we're going to do this. Mm, and that that there's nothing arbitrary. There's nothing, you know, there, it's very planned out and very, um, you know, creativity exists in a very organized world. Like a lot of people think creativity <laughs> is this thing that's like kind of wild and you're grabbing lightning bolts from the sky. But it's <laughs> when you're really, when you're really organized and you're really structured, you, you you have the things around you that are that are under like kind of under control in a sense. That's when your mind can kind of open up and, and interesting things start to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Oh, I that's, love that. That's so cool. Yeah, I love that. The your I love just the concept of like talking about. I love that you're putting it as like getting really meta about it. Um, the just like pulling back the veil almost a little bit on some of the stuff that like we've kind of just taken for granted. That when you're there in person, maybe some people are picking up on it. But even like I think what you were talking about earlier too, some of this is helping bring back the veil a little bit on stuff that like we might have also just been assuming students have been kind of getting when we're there in person, but we're not. At the end of the day, they weren't getting it there either. Like you're, yes. it's kind of forcing us to reevaluate how much we're explaining, how much we're pulling back, and even I love the concept of too, just like pulling back on like talking about the learning that's happening. Like, I think mm -hmm. sometimes people see that as wasted time or like, Oh, the students don't care about that. But like pulling back on that helps the student understand to your point, like the organization and the structure of why we're doing what we're doing so that they can better understand the why yeah. to get to the how and to, to learn that even, even better. I love that. That's super cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. nice. Um, and if I could quote you on the organized creativity thing, that'd be awesome. I'm just going to hold that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah I, I think, um, you know, a lot of times like students, there's a great quote by Chuck Close and he talks about inspiration. Chuck Close is a, he's a painter. The act yeah, sadly just passed away a couple of years ago, but he used to do these mm. really enormous paintings of, uh, of, of portraits. So they're like the size of your garage door. And you, you've probably seen them if you've been at the museum. He does okay. like very photorealistic and some pointillism and yeah. strange kind of, actually the, the painting assignment that I was talking about earlier is kind of, kind of like I show him as an example to the class, like okay. some of his portrait work, but he talks about inspiration being not something that, um, well, he says inspiration is for amateurs. He said the rest of us, you know, go to work and that Ooh. basically oh. his, his idea or what he's getting at is, that ideas are putting in the work is going to yield 
ideas and, and generate ideas. And, and the more and more you kind of work um, creating something, you're going to get more and more inspired. But if you sit back and wait for inspiration, it seldom comes to you. You know, yeah. it, it, you have to kind of put yourself in that that situation where you're working and, and things are starting to churn and ideas are starting to happen. So. Yeah. Even a eureka moment needs a needs yeah. environment. The environment yeah. has yeah. to be set for eureka to happen. Yeah, mm. that's that's beautiful. Well, that- um, oh, so as much as I want to dig deeper into that, there's so many things I want to <laughs> jump into. Um, we do on the high tech podcast have to talk about technology, uh, cause that's the thing we like some level, about, you know, that's kind of like, I feel like Will and I just started this cause we were like, we have a lot of apps we should tell people about. And then we were like, <laughs> man, we committed to this. Uh, we're running out of apps. Um, <laughs> we need to bring people on to talk about apps that we don't, we know need help. Yeah. So we were talking a little bit beforehand. Um, like if you could pick an app for your audience to share with it, that's really been helpful for you. Uh, what, what app would that, wouldn't that be? Um, I would say for, you know, we use Google as a learning management system. We have Google classroom, Google meet. Mm -hmm. So for me, Google, uh, Jamboard was hugely, um, helpful during, during Mm -hmm. the pandemic. And, and it's something that I've, I use, my personal practice as an artist and as a, you know, somebody that likes to kind of be organized. Um, it's a, it's a great ideation tool. Um, it's a good place that you can invite multiple people to see the same screen and they can take post-it notes. They can upload images. Mm -hmm. They can write, they, there's, there's drawing tools, there's laser pointers. Mm -hmm. So when I would use it in class, we would, I would use it as a, idea an idea place for students to upload their kind of preliminary ideas sketches thumbnail drawings so i can check in with them and critique the work and look at it and and Mm. point things out circle things take an image expand it point certain things out um and as a group we can i can even share a screen and show you know 15 students what what we're all looking at Right. And also it was a, not a, uh, it was an accountability tool also mm. and not in a punitive way, but in a way that I'm able to say, you know, the, the, this is one thing that I haven't mentioned yet, but all the classes were synchronous. So oh, we would, we would oh, go well. in there. I would introduce an assignment. We would look at images. Students would ask questions we would have a period where we would we would take a break. I would stay in the meet in case anybody wanted to ask questions, but they would work independently. And I would say, at noon, I want you to upload four images of different design, you know, ideas that we're working on. Yeah. So then mm-hmm. I'd say we would reconvene as a group, and then we would do a critique. So mm-hmm. it was very oh, much, wow. um, you know, giving them space to work. And also having that tool that they're able to kind of upload images and all the students have all the access. So Google, uh, Google right. Jamboard, yeah. you just keep flipping and you just have page after page after page. Almost infinitely. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, Jamboard. And, you know, for me, I love, I love it as an organizational tool. If I'm like kind of plotting the next few months for my studio practice as an artist, I'll do, I'll have different pillars of goals and things that I want to achieve mm. and, you know, awesome. make things bigger, make things smaller, create secondary pillars. And, yeah. Um, do you so, do you use it on like an iPad or touchscreen device at all, or do you just do uh, mostly on your computer? Yeah, I haven't tried that. I've, I've okay. you know do it on the computer. So, as I recall, this was actually a big question when we were dealing with our pivot, and um, unfortunately, Microsoft Microsoft's version didn't have very good mobile support while Jamboard was pretty good. Now I always like to verify that uh, memory of mine, but I'm, I'm pretty sure like it, it's almost as easy to use on an iPad, which when you mentioned like they could handwrite and stuff like handwriting with a mouse, not always as fun, but like if they actually have a tablet yeah. or something like that, they could be writing directly yeah. onto the device while doing that. Yeah, and now that you mentioned that, I do feel like there were students with stylus because you would see them like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you're like, you're not doing that with a mouse, yeah. <laughs> right? Well, somebody's like a mouse pro that I don't know about. That would be, uh, <laughs> you have to meet them. Um, 
I met a yeah. I met a uh, a Hebrew language faculty member once who did. Josh is like, ugh, uh, who did handwrite Hebrew with a mouse. So well, that, you know, that hurts like, me a little bit. I can barely it, sign it's incredible. like forms. Like I'm going <laughs> to sign a form and it looks like somebody like I just drew a pencil uh, and I don't even know how. <laughs> um, like that's, I know. I always feel know. funny, like signing signing a contract. I'm like, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, no, that's really cool. I like uh, we we talked about Google Jamboard a long time ago on the podcast. It was like briefly. Yeah. Uh, during one of the early episodes before we restrained uh, ourselves like from talking about too four, many apps. Maybe. Uh, yeah, it was two. I technically have it open, uh, but oh, there you go. Uh, I was going to reference it later, you know, because my bad, my do. bad. Um, but I love, the I love the co-host. Types. I love <laughs> those types of tools. Um, and Jamboard's a really great one, like from the Google side. We're like our institution's not a Google institution. So I end up, we've talked about it a bunch, but I use like Miro, which is a similar concept, mm-hmm. but the amount of what you can do in those collaborative like whiteboard spaces with students, I think is often undervalued, like just from like putting stuff into there, putting comments on it. Um, I've used yeah. it for like recording videos and things like when I'm trying to do like quick feedback on a paper or something, you know, like, so uh, that's cool. Yeah. That's really, really cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, and Google Jamboard, like, so you, you've, most folks will know Google in the context of their Gmail account. You actually probably can make a Jamboard with that, but I know from um, kind of a technical side, um, you can create a nonprofit or education Google suite, Google space for free. I don't know about size of institutions and stuff like that. So like maybe college level universities may be paying for it. I'm, I'm not too familiar, but like I've worked with some nonprofits, smaller groups where like you can set that up for free and you can have Jamboard available to your folks for free. You know what I mean? It's, it's, yeah. it's so easy to access. Yeah. Um, you, you know, you, you can have it with your dot edu account if that's the, how things are set up, but you can just use it with students at gmail.com, you know? So like the value for me in a tool like that is the access. It's so mm-hmm. available to anyone who might be listening to us across K-12 to higher ed from big universities with lots of money to the places Josh and I have worked with no money, right? Like we, <laughs> we know what that's like to mm-hmm. be scrimping for tools. So, yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I love it. And I think it's really important, especially, you know, students that are going to work eventually in a lot of collaborative situations with people from across the country, or even the globe, um, that somebody in Singapore or somebody in London can yep. can be on the jam board mm. at the same time. There's just a lot of good point. It's a really it's a really important tool. And like you said, well, it's not a uh, it's not something you have to spend you know, tons of money <laughs> to right. get. Right. So it's a, uh, but it's really important. And I think students love it too. And they love the, like I, I, cause well, I've introduced it to a lot of students and they're just like, cool. And they just <laughs> they is, jump right works. into it. <laughs> yeah. And they, they love, they love the, you know, being able to, it's kind of like, um, you know, giving them feedback on little post-it notes and things like that. Right. And, yeah. Where right. they can do that for their friends. Like if you, if you flip through, you'll see like, Oh, I really like what you did with this, and like people start commenting on on their classmates' designs, and oh, that's yeah. pretty awesome. That's yeah. awesome. I love it. Uh, this is this is why we enjoy this podcast. From like just the the deep conversations to the like, oh yeah, I've used that. I'm behind it. You're behind it. We can send that Google Jam board out to to everybody that yeah. needs it. Thank you, Justin, for taking the time with us this evening. It's been a pleasure. Very, Thank very you. thankful. Uh, I, I've, we, I, Josh and I took notes. I literally have like links and there's quotes yep. and stuff. Like we're just going to have to have a, a follow up on episode two sometime. I would love that. So thanks for having me. This, is, uh, this has been great. Absolutely. Hey, uh, Absolutely. maybe we'll grab a pint soon enough around town. We'll actually see each other in the physical, but um, awesome. Josh and I'll take a moment here to wrap up the episode and otherwise thank awesome. you again. Hey, thank you both. All right. Cheers. Hey, take care. Pivot. Sorry, I had to do it. Pivot. I feel like pivot. Um, <laughs> I, I had, I felt like that was the only way to come out of that. You know, the only way to pivot out of that conversation with Justin. Just to um, pivot. see, I said it. I'm not afraid of the word. I can do it. <laughs> um, man, what a cool conversation. I, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't I didn't know Justin really before this. I know you did. Um, but, uh, really cool perspective on, I yeah. think, um, 
just what it looks like to transition. I think we we package this a lot like what did it, what did you do to transition from online, right? And or transition during the pandemic. But really at the end of the day, it's like what did you do to transition to moving online? Like the principles yeah. Yeah, yeah. could still be used today for somebody who's trying to transition a program or a course online um that they're not used to. So I really appreciate Justin's perspective on that. Um especially just from this idea of like I think what was most what really just like a takeaway for me that really hit was kind of this idea of like those who try to take what they do in person and just kind of fit it like a puzzle piece into online when like, that's not designed for it. They're the ones who Isn't struggle. That how you do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's clearly, um, I don't really do puzzles, but if I did, I imagine that's not the way to do it. So, uh, well, and, and that's yeah. one of the things that really, I, I don't know if I think you might've said it before we actually started the episode, um, might not have come out in the, in the interview <laughs> itself, but like, the Jamboard tool is something that he's still using and using more. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's one example where he needed that to do the pandemic, but it's become so useful to his practice that it's not just like a once and done or now that the pandemic's over, ha ha. Like, like he's, and, he, and yeah. he did say in the, in the interview, he said, I use it even for my personal, you know, mm-hmm. note taking brainstorming, stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, great examples in my opinion great examples of like not only what do we do to survive but how we can use those skills the things we've i i love some of the language he was saying about like his work at the college um to help faculty with their pedagogy and like stuff that he's done Mm -hmm. making sure that it's like a pedagogical focus and like reaching the kids and being flexible with their learning and just really really positive stuff. And, and this is no dig at Justin, right? But he doesn't have like an education background. He's an artist and he's, yeah. a, he's a, a, a premier educational guy, kind of guy. Like I love the conversations I've had with him. Mm-hmm. I've been in um, not only like coffee shop conversations with him about this stuff, but like in those not teaching bagels. learning series yeah. and stuff, bagels are important to learning. Yeah. I mean, it, well, learning and, and, is kind of like a bagel, you know, like it's okay. uh, All right. Land the um, plane. Can you, can you, Continue your thought, though. At a difference to you, I'd like to continue uh, your thought, uh-huh. um, and I'll, I'll I'll circle back around <laughs> to that uh, <laughs> to that bagel conversation. I was just second. thinking of how you know uh-huh. when when he and I met and would go over the bagels, for instance. Like he would just use he would be making this this homemade schmear, and this is just a beautiful metaphor for education. You know, you yeah, take the cream cheese, in my yeah. you take uh, the the product that you might need, like strawberries, blueberries, or he yeah. would do them with like olives, like kalamata olives, and it would just be oh. But you you'd work those things together, and he'd actually hand make them, and then it would come out like a schmear. Like that to me was the difference between a schmear and cream cheese or schmear and like yeah. spread right like he, it he hand worked science. it and yeah. the landing this metaphor is to say <laughs> you know we all had education we've all had cream cheese but the delivery of that product the excellence you bring to it like justin would bring to his schmear by working the product working the working the strawberry into it with yeah. that love yeah. and tenderness is how we can really see, bring I it see, home i see where you're going yeah he's cooking cooking learning one could say you know, a little bit. You know, you bake know. bagels, right? Uh, I'm listen, cooking, baking, <laughs> same thing, okay? Um, and that wasn't me landing the bagel metaphor, okay? It was, it was just a statement. I think the <laughs> bagel metaphor, okay, is, is, you know, learning, <laughs> learning is, 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 is uh, God, I got nothing. You can't. I'll work on this. Okay, next episode, He's bagel metaphor. <laughs> yeah, bagel. We'll, I'll bring it. I'll bring it back. Workshop it. Maybe put it in. Uh, put, put it in Google yeah. Jamboard. Work I'll it out a little Google bit. Google Jamboard. I'll work it out. You know. Um. Uh, you know what? I'll I'll, I'll p- a Twitter post. Okay, I'm gonna hold oh. myself to this now. Okay? There you go. <laughs> if you don't follow us on Twitter at High Tech Podcast, go check it out at some point here in the general vicinity of this episode's release, I'm going to post a video on why I think education's like a bagel. Okay. There we go. And he's going to, he's going to deliver. And I'm going to ask Is chat. GPT to generate it for me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Both. And I want to see the comparison. So you have to write one and chat GTP right. has to write See one. who's better at it. It's probably chat GPT. They pass an MBA. Wow. Um, um, so anyway, this, that went this... so many directions. <laughs>
<laughs> no, I uh, I want to I want to highlight a few other things. Right back to what Justin said. Right, so it's um, he obviously is taking care and energy, and I think a lot of that has a lot of that is what we need to look at. I also I really appreciate his concept of and after the episode you know he did preface and say you know i do think inspiration can happen other places um (laughs) that just work you know but i like this this point because i think there's like this misconception that it's like that he said that it's like creativity happens in like must mean like freedom to do anything we want and at the end of the day that's not actually necessarily the, the truth sometimes restrictions um guidelines um situations we can't get around like having to move online can require us to do really creative things we wouldn't do if we just had the freedom to do whatever we wanted yeah and so like i think as us as educators we should look at that and go you know when it comes to online learning for instance we can't do whatever we want there there's things that work and don't work so within that realm how can we get excited about those limitations because they provide ways for us to do things creatively. Like I love his answer to, uh, is there anything you couldn't teach online? Like I was expecting like, you know, I don't know. I don't know different painting types, you know, like bagel painting hypothetically, um, you know, or like (laughs) with things I don't, I don't, I don't know, but his answer was no. And it's not like, I don't think he's being overly cocky. I think his point is, is to Justin, it's clearly him as a faculty member, uh, an educator, a person, it comes out very clearly that like, you know, Justin's kind of a guy who seems to like challenges and be Mm. creative. And I think the reason he was able to find interesting ways to do what he did um, is because he viewed it as an opportunity to change his learn, change his teaching practices and reshape some things with the goal of still helping his students learn. Yeah. And I think we can learn a lot about that when we're, whether it's online learning, hybrid, whatever we're trying to do face to face, Um, not just thinking the way we've always done it is the right way, but thinking there are different ways to do things. And I think like, if that's my takeaway here is it's like to do things successfully on online, we need to accept that there are probably different ways to do things. Even though like what you and I know who've done a lot of stuff online, there's plenty of things that you and I know that I'm sure there's other ways to do what we're doing that could be better and trying to continue to push ourselves to be creative and pursue those within the limitations we have in online learning, I think is, is a a good takeaway um, and good thing to push us in the right direction. Boom. Seal the deal. Uh, Warden that, that that's it. Just lock the, lock the cage on that one. I love it. Um, Thank you again, Justin. Hope to have you back soon. This has been episode 89 thrilled to have this conversation next episode 90 we are going to actually have an interview with my brother dr charles illingworth double illingworth it's not as good as a double rainbow i promise um he is a a doctor of acupuncture we're going to hear a little bit about what his pivot in the pandemic was like what it's been like to kind of bring virtual teaching practices into his experience as an acupuncturist both from learning now to teaching Um, and he's going to leave us with not only kind of an example of, of something that works in his field, a manual of acupuncture as an app, but he comes back to Google meet and some Google tools too, for, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what he wants to leave with the audience. So tune in next week, next episode for 90, where we're here from Dr. Illingworth. He got there first. I always wanted to be Dr. Illingworth and he, congratulations to him. Much love brother. Um, he got there first. So tune in for that find us on twitter or youtube at high tech podcast email us inbox at high tech pod dot us josh they actually have two emails in our inbox we need to look at tonight from people oh, really reaching out to us i forgot Ooh. about this so wow. you too audience, should know you can email us we will and don't take maybe, what just happened to mean that will isn't going to pay attention to them um or josh late but we will I'll look be, at the I'll be honest will is the better one with the communication side of our podcast so i'm not gonna get annoyed or angry yeah, about that at all that felt, 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 it's fine we'll, anyway. we'll eventually answer you 2022 20 well that's over 2023 wow yeah or yeah. 2024 <laughs> we'll get back to you you know <laughs> we'll see it's <laughs> up in the box if you want to see any of our episode pages, any of the resources we create for every single episode, head to hightechpod.us, other contact information, information about the education podcast network, et cetera. All of it is on our website. Please share that with others. Uh, subscribe to the podcast, subscribe on YouTube, like us on Twitter, do all the good things. We love that kind of engagement. Yep. Thank you again, as always 
for joining us for another week of the High Tech Podcast as we continue to learn what it looks like to harness technology in the classroom, whether it's online, hybrid, or in person. Until next time. See ya. See ya.